Just a minute. I'll be right there. Almost got it. There we go. Hey, how's it going? Everyone on this site has already made their video asking what happened to the Fairly Odd Parents, including one of the editors of this miniseries. You can find their thumbnail in an officially licensed Ren and Stimpy documentary. The general consensus around this franchise is that the first five seasons were great, while seasons six through eight saw a noticeable decline, and that's where it first became god awful. Fairly god awful. After rewatching the Oh Yeah cartoon shorts and seasons one through five for the first part of this retrospective, I came to the conclusion that the quality steadily improved until season three, saw some stagnation outside of specials around season four, and became lazier with its humor and character writing around season five. Today I'll be covering season six, seven, and eight to see if the beginning of the back half of the show lives up to its legacy, or if there's some bright spots that might have been glossed over. I'll admit that I'm a little biased. My first memories of this series were seeing the ads for the season six premiere and other event episodes before I eventually jumped on board in fall of 2012, especially after a Christmas themed marathon of specials caught my interest. That got me prepared for the launch of season nine a few months later. The last few standard definition seasons were just as new to me as the original run, although it was very easy to tell the difference. I consumed basically every episode out of order over the span of a few months through recorded reruns. I still remember buying a few on iTunes or on DVD just for a chance to watch them. Let me know if there's any episodes that you never caught as a kid or any I mentioned here that you had absolutely no idea about. I want to know if anyone else had trouble tracking down the Wishology three-parter years after it aired. I would like to meet the Nickelodeon scheduling guy who decided to air parts one, two, but not three, weeks apart with no advertising. <laughs> what a fond childhood memory. I see season five's Timmy TV as a sign of things to come. Timmy discovers that his life has been secretly broadcast to Fairy World as a reality show. It's technically a status quo change that's never brought up again, but it's a silly farce, down to the villain being a Simon Cowell parody. Eventually, Fairy executives meddle with Timmy's life for better ratings. They make pointless visual changes by turning Turner's hat purple, best friends Chester and AJ are kicked off and replaced with new characters, Timmy's mom is recast into a live action TV star, and the Fairly Odd Parents becomes a cheesy sitcom without much heart, a parody of itself, a parody that was about to become a reality. In January of 2006, Butch Hartman took to his website to announce the cancellation of both Danny Phantom and The Fairly Odd Parents after producing 53 and 80 half hours respectively. To reference my favorite retro Butch Hartman tweet, for the first time it seemed like this happy Sunday turned into Monday. Nickelodeon spaced out the airing of the final fops throughout 2006, and on February 7th, 2007, it was announced that the series had been revived, being renewed for a sixth season. During this hiatus, Nick produced an 11 minute clip show special called The 77 Secrets of the Fairly Odd Parents, released during a marathon on July 7th, 2007. It featured trivia surrounding the characters and creator, so fittingly this was co-written by Hartman and features a few voice actors. Otherwise, the production staff of the series wasn't involved, and you can tell. I ate refried beans for dinner last night. <laughs> Technically, this isn't an official episode and can only be found through online reuploads nowadays. But back in 2007, this was all fans got during a 15 month hiatus. This special is similar to the Atlanta Square Panis behind the scenes feature at released the same year, just with more lines. Timmy's birthday is March 21st. Happy birthday, Timmy. Which happens to be the same as one Chip Skylark. I think they forgot the twist ending of the episode they were referencing. Your birthday is until tomorrow. What? It's funny how this special is framed like it's delivering never before seen top secrets, but they couldn't even get the name of Fairy World right. This probably won't appeal to a casual fan, but I think it has a few worthwhile inclusions. There's a few new pieces of artwork, nifty transitions, a character from one of Hartman's failed pilots can be seen in his office, Family Guy was officially acknowledged on Nickelodeon, oh, word. and there were a few reveals for season six. 
they showed off Cosmo and Wanda's male carrier designs that would appear in Merry Wishmas and alluded to a major development that had been in the works for a while. There's a brand new character joining the Fairly Odd Family, and this new character may have just poofed Ooh. their pants. In 2004, prior to being canceled, Butch Hartman and Steve Marmel wrote a feature film adaptation for Paramount Pictures and Nickelodeon movies that didn't see the light of day, thanks to a last minute regime change. Guys, we're gonna make a movie. I'm disappointed that this never came to be, simply because I know it probably would have looked gorgeous. The closest we'll get to it visually is probably the Powerpuff Girls movie. I can see them trying to do one of those insane extended shrugging out shots. I even yelled over one of them in front of a live audience a few months ago. Part of me is glad it didn't happen, because then I'd be here complaining about how the road trip storyline was cliche, the subplot where Chester gets a love interest was unnecessary, the giant CGI Mr. Crocker looks outdated today, and Smash Mouth's cover of the theme song was really unfitting. The actual film was to explore the origins of Fairy World and feature Cosmo and Wanda having a baby, Dusty, named after Fairy Dust. I wonder if that idea went anywhere, or if this is just an obvious segue for, oh, there we go. go into this video thinking that I was going to defend Poof, but here we are. Yes, I think that Poof can be nothing more than a cute plot device, and is entirely useless far too often to justify his inclusion. Multiple episodes write him out or have moments where Timmy does something with Cosmo and Wanda acting in unison, while Poof just floats there in the background. But with all that being said, I think he works thematically. Poof reinforces the love of Cosmo and Wanda, which sorely needed a positive shot in the arm and he helps Timmy become more responsible, which has been a major recurring theme, especially in event episodes or specials. A precedent had also been set for status quo changes, and the main trio's dynamic had evolved over time. Even if he was a desperate attempt to gain attention using a dated TV trope, Poof wasn't a bad idea, just a poorly executed one. Fairly Odd Baby sees the birth of this very pale infant, delivering the most disappointing gender reveal ever. It's a boy, because boys love water squirters! Where is it? They spend half the episode trying to find the meat! Let me just check. We really should check. There's a few questionable inclusions I can nitpick, like Cosmo being the latest fairy baby to be born, despite other fairies looking visibly younger, and anti-fairy world and pixie world being introduced out of the blue. And yet, each act introduces something exciting. Whether it's establishing Poof's powers or building up to an elaborate fart joke, it's a fun time even if half the humor comes from either tears, vomit, poop, or piss. It was also the highest rated episode in series history, and it revolved around male pregnancy. Duh, having a B word here. Welcome back, Fairly Odd Parents. It's like you never laughed. Why did you do this to me? Look at me, I'm fat! <laughs> While many fans will claim this to be the point where they dropped off, I think season 6 isn't too far from the quality of season 5, even if it is far less memorable. Had writer Steve Marmel left to co-create Yin Yang Yo with former art director Bob Boyle, and love it or hate it, he brought his signature brand of comedy with him. I'm totally hot! I know! Guys will finally listen to you when you blather on about the environment! What should we do? And I think if we all planted one tree, the world would be a much better place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. I hear you. You're hot enough to be right. The recurring cynicism and self-awareness I attribute with Marmel has been toned down in Fop, aside from a few good old-fashioned all-women-are-nags jokes. Uh-oh! It's Mount McNaggy Nag, and she's gonna blow! Instead, we get a concerning number of jokes about how sad adults are. Cosmo and Wanda are constantly overworked with their newborn, the Crimson Chin is lonely, and Timmy's parents are worried about him becoming despondent. I guess this is one way to age with your audience. Is your child despondent? Well, don't blame them, blame yourself. Do they use a lot of paper towels, spend too much time alone in their rooms, and say, don't bother me? I'm just gonna take these paper towels up to my room alone, so don't bother me. <sighs> Poof naturally attracts the company of other fairies due to being the only fairy baby in existence. So this is a big season for the fairy world regulars like Mama Cosma, Dr. Rip Stubwell, and Cupid. I'm in love with Jack. 
Flapjack, that is. Gay people laugh. The Fairly Odd Olympics half hour special, lots of puns on the show's title this season, doesn't have a single moment taking place on Earth. I guess there's the live action cameo from champion figure skater Scott Hamilton, but I don't think that counts. His animated caricature is shaped like a bowling pin. I caramba! Here, Timmy is sick of being the neutral party and deciding who's better, the fairies, anti-fairies, or pixies. It would have been cool to see him wish something up that equalized their powers, but instead the score is settled through the fairy world games. Unfortunately, this marks the final appearance of the pixies, which is a shame. I was enjoying how the head pixie and anti-cosmo were paired up starting this season. To be fair, these pointy pencil pushers didn't have much of a presence after their big role as the villains of Schools Out. Still, I'll miss these guys for the specific brand of boredom they brought to Timmy's increasingly shrinking rogues gallery. I'm surrounded by pixies who tell me what I want to hear all day. Watch. Who's the greatest? You are, sir. Suck ups. The very gradual back and forth between the fairies and their adversaries prevents the conflict from feeling thrilling, even though the plot gets straight to the point and the stakes are high. Timmy accepts a bet to become a servant to his enemies if one of them wins the sports competition. It's just like that questionable allusion to slavery in Space Jam. The Fairly Odd Olympics is about on par with shelf life as far as these specials go, where it's a good time, but I don't know if it needed to be double length. I have more memories of the Nick.com Flash game at Spawn, Foul Play, based on the briefly shown Duckzooka game where you fling birds through elaborate structures and you can free other birds in cages and hey, wait a minute. As a result of the shift in focus towards fairies, Timmy's schoolmates began their descent into the background, with the elementary school setting only making a handful of appearances. You start to get the feeling that Mr. Crocker and Timmy's parents were a lot easier to write for. You rebuilt and reconnected our family! Cool! Play date over! Let's ignore Timmy and go watch more TV! Birthday Bash is kind of the end of an era for guest stars, marking the final appearances of Adam West as himself and Chris Kirkpatrick as Chip Skylark. The latter does a birthday-themed cover of My Shiny Teeth and Me, and as much as I enjoy this track, it popped up in the background too much. If there's a party scene, you'll probably hear it's instrumental, and it's used twice before it was even played in full. And here's his new hit song, My Shiny Teeth and Me. The best example of this is in Wishology Part 3, where the background music sneakily changes. <laughs> Funnily enough, its penultimate appearance explains the song's prominence. I am glad that Chip being screwed over by his record company stayed consistent. And here's a song from me, and it's royalty free. When the side characters are at the forefront, we get Merry Wishmas. It is the worst episode of the season. Cheese and Crockers has Mr. Crocker captured Timmy's fairies in a sudden and distracting manner that would be a jump the shark moment if we didn't already get one this season, but the second Christmas special really got me feeling like this. Santa moves into Timmy's house and ruins his life for a year just to teach the kid a lesson. You now understand the true meaning of Christmas. Yes, I know he's Santa, but he ends up making the purposely selfish Timmy come off as relatable. I almost don't want to call this one out, since it features the last truly great big original song, Not On The List, which I would use for every honorable mention section of my countdowns if it had an instrumental. We can't believe the holiday season looks like this, because none of this stuff was on a Christmas list. A lot of these episodes aren't bad, just very by the books, with a few exceptions. In King Chang, Mark Chang's arc being on the run from his arranged bride Mandai, who there is surprisingly not much fan art of, gets a strong conclusion when he learns that someone is trying to take out the Yucatamian king. I will quickly solve this challenging mystery. Mark Chang, it is I, Mandai. Mystery? It's revealed that Mandai only wanted to marry Mark for his royalty and never actually loved him. And yeah, I buy that. <laughs> Yeah. The climax cleverly calls back to multiple Mark appearances, leading to Mandai's defeat. This allows the alien prince to freely return to Yucatamia whenever the story demands it, reintroducing a setting that Timmy had no reason to visit for the past three seasons. The planet only makes two more noteworthy appearances, but at this point I care more about Mark as a character than the setting he was attached to, and that means the writing did its job. This is working! <laughs> this is fun! 
functioning properly! In four emergencies only, the back half of the original show's midpoint, Timmy is given an emergency wand, while Cosmo and Wanda are busy getting Poof ready for a photo shoot. But the ending contains a refreshingly honest emotional moment. Poof has been subtly driving a wedge between Timmy and his godparents, as seen in a few subplots early in the season, where the fairies abandon Timmy to care after Poof or get some alone time. Despite having a son, Cosmo and Wanda still consider their godson a part of their family. This is a family photo, and you're part of the family! <laughs> Love you guys. Moments like this bring out the found family aspect of the show's premise and demonstrate that its heart was still intact. However, for emergencies only is otherwise a standard romp. Howdy, partner! Brief moments like this aren't enough to reach the overall highs achieved years prior, and I think this can be attributed to the new story editor and co-executive producer Scott Fellows. Scott Fellows was a staff writer throughout seasons 3, 4, and 5. Best known for creating one of the biggest animated series on Netflix, Johnny Test, which was a few seasons in when he took over Steve Marmel's position. To be fair, The End of the University was the first full episode I watched, and feeling so similar to the kid with a head of fiery hair and a turbocharged backpack was what motivated me to check out more. I'm still naked! As much as I enjoy Fellow's work, stories under his supervision can blend together, within and between his shows. During my rewatch, it was a little surprising how often this season was Johnny Test in the Fairly Odd Parents style. I know not every FOP viewer has the encyclopedic knowledge of JT that I do, but there's so many jokes and catchphrases that were recycled or went on to be reused. I'm back! I'm back! Hit Cosmo's Turbo Speed Boost button! That's my cotton candy button! Now let's hit the Turbo Boost button. To hit the parachute button. Okay, now I know I've seen this somewhere before. I'm telling you, I've seen this somewhere before. In terms of character portrayals, I think the strangest episode from this era is Momni Present, which also has my favorite title. How did you find me? With mother's intuition, of course. And this super high-tech tracking device that I created when I worked for the CIA before you were born. Mrs. Turner is probably the most skilled and caring member of her family, at least when she's there to support her kid. But Momni Present invents new traits for her that are only contained to this episode just to make the plot work. A Russian submarine? I was a double agent. It's the kind of forced writing I've seen before with Trixie and Wanda, and it's partially why I remember this being a season seven episode. Same with Vicky Gets Fired, where Vicky is reframed as a full-on villain, with the potential of being a dark empress of everything that breathes, who's stuck being Timmy's babysitter, taking away the humanity a few season four outings tried to give her. <laughs> Going back to Momni Present, I think the aforementioned traits are actually more at home in Johnny Tess's mom than Timmy Turner's mom. The parents in that show are much more involved in the reality-bending hijinks of their kids, taking heavy precautions to keep them out of trouble. So when you get an episode like Johnny Goes Nuts, where Johnny's mom Lila is always one step ahead of his attempts to leave the house, it's a lot easier to buy than in Fairly Odd Parents. <laughs> Adding to the list of out of place Scott Fellows influences, Dark Laser, a one joke wonder Star Wars parody character, and his flipping dog toy companion Flipsy, return because guess who wrote his debut episode? Mr. Black and Mr. White are knocked off too, but I'm kind of okay with that because both of them are played by Patrick Warburton. <laughs> <laughs> The pop culture references in this batch make less sense than usual. I'm glad we finally got the Knight Rider reference I waited four seasons for, but these kinds of jokes were typically very random and blatant. Fair the Odd Baby stops in its tracks to do this stupid unrelated Bee Gees running joke about the birds and the Bee Gees, which has wormed its way into my brain. At least it taught me enough about the band to know what my dad was saying when he mentioned that he thought one of their songs was called Four Letter Woman. You see, when the Bee Gees recorded Saturday Night Fever, everybody loved them. Then there was a backlash. Too much Bee Gees, they said, and... All I know is I was erased from everyone's memories. I barely escaped being destroyed by the Eliminators, figured out an impossible kiss riddle, Got chased by Murph to get to Marf, only to have you to tell me I need a secret code, which I don't have, because I'm playing on TV Wish all 
trilogy is a trilogy of 44 minute specials where Timmy is destined to fight a swirling void of ancient evil known as the darkness and must defeat it before he's captured by its terminator like minions the eliminators this was the last time nickelodeon pulled out all the stops promoting the show giving each part their own flash game and dropping six half hours of season six throughout one weekend as a result, these were the only new episodes for most of 2009. That's such a crazy, wacky, silly, and weird way to release a product that takes years to make. I know that I've covered this episode before, along with a few season 10 episodes, but that was five years ago, before I learned how to level other people's audio. Isn't that right, special guest Saber Spark? That sounds about right, Nick. When I used to do Fairly Odd Parents videos, the series was still ongoing. So I can now say with confidence that this is the crustiest shot in the whole run. Uh, we're still spinning! Okay, I'll give them credit for cutting a little deeper than most do with the Matrix references here. Who doesn't love parodies of classic trilogies like The Matrix? Well, they didn't know there would be a fourth film. The Lord of the Rings. Well, the Hobbit movies hadn't started rolling out yet. And Harry Potter. Okay, that was almost six movies deep. One of Wishology's defining features is the presentation. Until season nine, these were the only episodes to be produced in high definition. And the transition is just as smooth as it was for SpongeBob when it got a special the same year. CGI assets are everywhere, and they were used to create basically the same trucking out shot multiple times. These robots don't emote too well, but their sleek designs pair nicely with the 2D characters. The exception is the Rock Guardian. What exactly happened here? Before this wand you can possess, you must first pass the chosen test. Whether or not it was always apparent, the shading and compositing on the 3D models have come a long way. I don't think the darkness would look nearly as menacing without that technology. Most of it isn't as distracting as... Oh wait, hold on a sec. I gotta get my exercise in for the day. I'll do some jumping jacks after I switch my room into Matrix Mode. <laughs> just like Matrix Timmy. This trio of 44 minute specials should be the most noteworthy post-revival episodes, but each part feels like the staff were making them up as they went along. Part 1, The Big Beginning, feels the most exciting, even if the storytelling suffers from not feeling cohesive, with too many inconsequential moments of this happens and then this happens. Yay! My dad's a cop! There's also a cameo from KISS, where the band is revealed to be ancient fairy warriors that are thousands of years old. I do wonder which band is secretly their anti-fairy equivalent. The Pixies already got one. Guy Moon won an Annie for his composing work on this one, and rightfully so. The score gets a little more cinematic and orchestral to emphasize the looming and seemingly unstoppable threats that Timmy faces. The standout track has to be when Timmy triumphantly shreds on the white wand to defeat the darkness. Go, white boy, go! Part 2, the exciting middle part, has the same problem as Fairly Odd Baby, where you can tell where different writers took over based on where the running gags begin and end. It might be one of the funnier Mark Chang episodes, but the characters get captured or run in literal circles to artificially extend the story. There's a second one! This is where I first noticed this dumb running gag of Timmy freaking out whenever faced with something strange, which almost became a trademark joke for him after first appearing in Open Wide and say, ah! I like the poses, but they feel like misplaced cracker jokes. Although, that's an intriguing parallel if it was done intentionally. Speaking of unintentional parallels... Hi, I'm Sparky. Timmy teams up with his villains, and his loved ones meet his fairies, but very few interesting interactions come out of what should be monumental moments in the canon. Mm. I was more fascinated with the choice to pair up one Dissimo and Cupid in fairy world scenes, which happened a few times throughout this season too. Yes, we are free! I never get tired of that. Well, I do! There's a deleted moment in the script where, and I'm not making this up, it's implied that Cupid touches one Dissimo's nipple, but they never explicitly say that they're in a relationship. I wonder what Tara Strong, the voice of Timmy Turner, thinks about that. 
I wish you'd say gay! There were lots of interesting cuts from earlier drafts, like Wanda calling Cosmo hot, a line that foreshadows the darkness's true nature, and a Just Can't Wait to Be King style musical number that's still referenced visually in the final cut. Also, it was pointed out to me that in a joke where a few minutes of part three are rewound, there's a few shots where Cosmo is confetti that were changed later in production. Uh oh, he's sleeping. Everybody be quiet. Okay, I'll be quiet. Part 3, the final ending, was my favorite of both this trilogy and all of season 6, even though I watched all of these in one sitting, which was a bad idea. Don't do that! Don't do that! I didn't care for the villain, but it felt the most focused and cohesive, bringing back characters from the past two parts. Timmy actually got to interact with Cosmo and Wanda, and Brendan Fraser's voice performance as Turbo Thunder made that character super entertaining. His deliveries fit right in with the other vocal talent, and by that, I mean he yells a lot. Then I perched myself atop the highest peak in a land I now dubbed Thunderworld, and waited for the darkness to return so I could seek my revenge! I love how the ending statement of part three is a sigh of relief that this giant event is over. But at least I don't have to find any more ones. It's relatable, like I much rather they made each part a half hour like the early specials instead of spending 30% of the season revisiting and only occasionally elevating the same few ideas. <laughs> Wishology doesn't have anything to say about the cast or themes of the Fairly Odd Parents, but it's such a big event that I understand why some fans would have liked it to end here. I personally think that this wouldn't have made for a great finale, and there's no evidence in here to suggest that it was meant to be, besides maybe this Cosmo line. Uh, wow, that could be my biggest blunder ever! I can't call this a satisfying resolution when the major question of whether or not Timmy is the intended Chosen One, even though he has all the powers of the Chosen One, is left up in the air. The specials are also quite self-contained, as the Eliminators are never mentioned before or after this, so it doesn't have the same satisfaction you get from seeing other villains return in these specials. Even though there's some moments that are important to the lore, like Timmy kissing Trixie, everyone's minds are wiped off screen afterwards. So it, it don't, don't matter. matter. None, None of this, of this matters. matters. Honestly, Wishology could have been a jumping off point for more serialized Fairly Odd Parents. Nickelodeon probably wouldn't have gone for this considering that random reruns were a huge part of its success. But Danny Phantom proved that Butch Hartman had a vested interest in this kind of comic-inspired storytelling, there were already lots of status quo shifts, and a few years later, lots of cable cartoons started to embrace light serialization. If the creators wanted the show to keep evolving, I think embracing the action comedy side would have been the next logical step. Instead, season 6 played things safe, lost a bit of the show's identity, and poof didn't add much. On the other hand, we just got the series back. I want to see what's next! Wait, go back. The Chosen One has fled his world, and now with magic, there's nothing stopping me from making it my world. These are bleak times, and the darkness is still out there. But as the Chosen One, I know if we stick together, we can defeat it. I don't have special powers like you. I'm just a normal boy. Worst Chosen One ever. I cannot be stopped, Chosen One. I have all the power in the universe. Man, I hate being the Chosen One. Don't mess with the Chosen One. Only one hero is capable of saving the Earth from Space Empress Vicky's dastardly babysitter Ray, and that hero is... Last time I covered the first Fairly Odd Parents console game, a 3D collectathon platformer called Break Into Rules, released in 2003. That's break in with an apostrophe, the spelled the, but rules isn't spelled with a Z instead of an S. I know that wouldn't match the show, but it feels right for the game title, you know? A year later, a sequel running on the same engine was released from the same developers, Blitz Games, Shadow Showdown. The story has Cosmo and Wanda's wand stop working after the Royal Jewel, the most powerful source of fairy magic and one of multiple plot points that hasn't been mentioned before or since, is stolen from Fairy World. In order to wish his broken TV back to normal so he can watch the Crash Nebula season finale, Timmy must gather the ingredients for a fairyversary muffin after they're taken by his babysitter and parents. Shadow Showdown has a heavier emphasis on storytelling that shows off the improved presentation. Wake him up! 
There's still static scenes where Timmy, Cosmo, and Wanda cycle through idle animations, but they're supported by fully animated intro and outro cutscenes for each level, complete with original music and newly uncompressed audio, all of which you can finally skip. I lost the sugar, the flour, and the milk, but the egg is still okay. Hmm, I must be losing my touch. These are still a little rough, but the sound design and dialogue is a lot closer to the series. Well, sometimes it is. Fairies can fly, of course. We don't need any stairs. But I do. Stairs are fundamental to my ability to go up and down. I also don't know why Cosmo references the Noid, a character from Domino's advertising campaigns who is now Crash Bandicoot's best friend. Am I the droid? Levels are a little bigger than before, but still follow one linear route. There's a little more backtracking, but that's only because they're often laid out to have a few branching paths off from a main hub, following in the footsteps of the chinless blunder stage from Break Into Rolls. The only side missions are these two brief third-person shooter sections with Cosmo and Wanda. You don't have to hit any enemies, and I don't think there's a penalty for taking damage, so they aren't much of a challenge, except when I accidentally chose to replay one of them. They remind me a lot of the Rocket and Plane segments from the SpongeBob game, Creature from the Krusty Krab, also developed by Blitz. These games have a lot of similarities, like comic book inspired levels, and a mechanic where you use a winch to open a gate. If you mention this to anyone who played the Wii version of Creature from the Krusty Krab, I guarantee that you will give them more flashbacks. These shooter sections also appeared as optional local multiplayer mini games where you can play as Timmy, Cosmo, Wanda, Chester, or AJ. I invited my friend Matt over to try them out with me. Longtime viewers might remember Matt from the Pickle Nick segment I did way back in my Worst of 2017 video. Since then, he's helped me film all of the subsequent Pickle Nick segments. Think about it, hundreds of thousands of people only know him for his influence on this running gag. Naturally, we're great pals. <laughs> Hey, so now the footage is in 4x3 because I was using emulated footage because it looks better as opposed to here where I haven't touched this recording software in like eight years. So here we go. I'm here with Matt. Hello. <laughs> and we're going to be doing the multiplayer mode for Shadow Showdown. So I'm going to be Wanda because uh, since this was, came out around season four, season five, she likes to beat people up. So she <laughs> should be definitely more powerful. What? Half the minigames are missing. Oh, that's not good. I thought I uh, unlocked all of them, but I guess it's tied to like the collectibles that I didn't get all of because I'm lazy. Well, how are we going to know what happens in Roller Pinball? Uh, we could just like put some footage on screen that's from true. someone else's gameplay and be like, whoa, look at Roller Pinball. Whoa, Is that a... the, the ball it's rolling around the screen. Oh, I oh. Won. oh you won? See, now uh, I won. You won. All right, so just for a minute, press Y to fire your suit spray at the correctly suited gesture to score points. This is an intense game. Yeah. I feel like I'd get along with Butch Harmon. <laughs> Why? Uh, I'd be like, yeah, man. <laughs> You're right. People who True. critique are weak. <laughs> I love Sparky. Uh, next game is Fairies on Patrol. Fly through the dream world, press A to shoot items for points. This one kind of sucks. This is not as fun as the first one. I do like that it bumps you back to the, the title screen every single time. Yeah, so you get take to- take in that awesome PNG of Timmy's house. <laughs> chin hockey, ooh, crimson chin. For this one, Butch, uh, we're gonna put a little blue guy in the middle and then they're gonna jump around on the ice hockey floor <laughs> and they have to get it in the other opponent's goal. And he's like, sounds great with me. I'm gonna go work on Danny Phantom season four pre-production. It's gonna be great. Who do you think is like the most attractive Fairly Odd Parents character? Oh dude, it's gotta be Juan Dissimo. There is, I had to scan through Butch Hartman's Tumblr account. Back then he posted this shirtless photo of Juan Dissimo with a rose and it's really high quality and it was never used in any like marketing material or anything. And it looks like it's, it doesn't look like a screenshot from the show. It looks like custom drawn buff Wandissimo art. So it's gotta be him. I feel like all the crew members would agree with me. But yeah, it looks like he just didn't unlock the other mini games. Actually, we can, we can go in and see everything that I got uh, in the game. This is where Jorgen is. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there's Jorgen. This is where he hangs out. <laughs> Oh, yeah, what was that? It's like a whole concussion and a half. Uh, the, it looks like when you're flashing back to a memory, like here, <laughs> here you go. 
I'm not really sure what to do, so I think I'm gonna transition out of this. Uh, we'll, we'll flash back out of this, so I'll get another concussion. Every Shadow Showdown level has a boss battle too, and they all have distinct ways of being defeated through platforming or puzzle solving instead of just shooting at them until they died. Although some were annoying to deal with because of the hard to avoid enemies or projectiles that would get in the way. Luckily, there's a checkpoint after every chunk of health. Some would say that makes the game too easy, especially since the life system is gone. But I'm terrible at video games, so I don't mind if a game helps boost my ego. Progression has been streamlined, as each new environment features nine wish stars Timmy has to track down to be granted three new abilities. Some are very rudimentary, unresponsive, or recycled, and I would have liked to swap between them on the fly, instead of needing to open up a menu and hold down the left trigger. However, when you have to swap between them in rapid succession to solve puzzles, that led to some of my favorite moments. When I learned there was going to be a pinball wish, I thought it was going to be its own minigame. Um, it's a big ball that I go inside of? It's not! Quite what I expected! But instead, you have to get out of a pinball form to change the angle of the bumpers to get the ball moving in the right direction, and that felt super rewarding. Another highlight was the plot-oriented Get a Clue, where Timmy explores a sprawling royal mansion. You get to go full Stone Tower Temple and turn it upside down and get ghost powers, where you can walk through walls, disappear, and not fly, but it's funny how this game was released just mere months after Danny Phantom launched. I'm already scary, watch this. I got a ton of comments where people told me how much they preferred Shadow Showdown over Break Into Rules. I don't disagree with that perspective, but I think it took two steps forward and one step back. The levels here are bigger and feel less empty, but as a result, there's only seven instead of nine, tutorials included. That means not as much visual variety, fewer side characters get involved, and less music too. Many of the main level themes are atmospheric, which can benefit certain locations like Yugopotamia. But to my dismay, there's not as many hummable tunes besides some of the themes for bosses or special events. It's clear that certain mechanics are only here to pad the game out, like increasing the number of optional collectibles, having to backtrack to the start of an area, or guiding non-playable characters to buttons. Surprise, surprise, they frequently got stuck on walls or stuck in place along the way. There are plenty of specific, albeit small, nods to the series in Shadow Showdown, like snippets of the Fairly Odd Parents theme appearing in cutscenes. Same thing with the Crimson Chin's jingle. The Crimson Chin! A few bosses are based around semi-obscure foes, like H2 Olga in Take It On The Chin, and the giant fighting robot that Mr. Turner built in A Mile On My Shoes appears at the end of Dad's Dream. Many of this level's visuals call back to his early appearances, so there's the trophy from Father Time alongside lots of machinery and workbenches, referencing his rarely seen abilities as a somewhat successful inventor. Wow, your dad doesn't skip on his dreams. He's committed! The themes and presentation of levels like this are more original than the game's predecessor, but it removes some of the excitement behind getting to play through recreations of specific episodes or locations. It was cool to explore Fairy World or Chimpsdale from Ever Catastrophe, but the mechanics and visuals of the Crimson Shin and Crash Nebula theme levels are recycled, so they don't feel as special. For a closer comparison, take the hub worlds of both games. Break Into Rules has you travel through a small but faithful recreation of Timmy's house that opens up as you complete more levels. Shadow Showdown has Jorgen's base of operations, which was made up for this game and is just a bunch of monitors strung together. So many screens can't stop watching TV! The lack of anything visually interesting or ways to distinguish the different sections made this a hub world I never look forward to returning to. When you enter a level through it, you'll be treated with a little title card inspired by the series. The ones found at Breaking the Rules edited stock poses on a few occasions or look rough around the edges, but I thought most of them were fine. When the title cards in Shadow Showdown didn't use stock poses, you can tell the artist behind them was probably drawing to me for the first time, but man, these are rough. Speaking of Timmy's face, both of these FOP games do something really clever to get around showing him at a weird angle. 
His hair flips sides and his facial features fade around his face depending on the direction Timmy is facing. You can even see it in some of the cutscenes. Um, this looks like Fairy World. This game's ending left me feeling empty. There's a random twist behind the Royal Jewel Thief that could've used some foreshadowing. Huh. And the final boss itself has some decent tension behind him, but goes down too quick and easy. It could've used a second phase, especially when there's a basis for one in the final cutscene. Shadow Showdown was definitely an improvement in terms of mechanics and presentation, with its own identity to boot. But that came with the cost of being a faithful adaptation. It's a bloated sequel, but I'd still recommend it over the first game if you want a decent dose of nostalgia for classic fairly odd parents, as well as early 2000s 3D puzzle platformers. I'm disappointed that Blitz Games didn't get the opportunity to create a trilogy by making one more game, and it probably would have been influenced by Season 4 after it finished airing in 2005. Episodes like Shelf Life or Channel Chasers would have lent themselves well to levels or even the premise for a whole adventure. The latter was even the basis for a Pac-Man ripoff on a Nicktoons plug-and-play system. Although it's good that the developers didn't base a game around traveling through TV channels, because they would have been ripping off a beloved video game franchise. Gex! Where are we? What are these weird words? Credits, Cosmo, remember? The TV magic made Vicky's space show into reality. It's all the fault of whoever stole the royal jewel. I get it. And the show ended when we won, so the credits roll. No? Ooh, they're making me dizzy. We should get out of here before the commercial started. Very hard here with breaking news. I have pink eyes. For every fairy, there is an anti-fairy. So this season premiere introduced Poof's equivalent. Hello, Clarice. I mean, mother. Everything he does is a variation on one of four jokes. He is evil, he is baby, he is gross, or he is British. This cartoon hates British people. There's no other explanation. Awesome! We're not British! I'll give Anti-Poof credit for introducing Foop with some gravitas, even featuring one of the last dedicated fight scenes, although he's never this overpowered ever again. There's some traits of Foop introduced that would quickly be forgotten by Season 8, like how he has the opposite of Poof's mood powers, refuses to scheme with others, and is a bad guy who isn't Timmy's enemy. Nevertheless, Foop doesn't make the strongest first impression, but Eric Bauza still does a terrific job playing him in what was one of his first major voice acting gigs. <laughs> A sleepy time mobile? That's the best you can- Fittingly, season 7 is like the opposite of its predecessor. The episodes are more notable, but that means that the highs and lows stick out a whole lot more. It's become clear that the comedy is what's primarily driving the characters. If the godchild in question is in any way unhappy or dissatisfied with the services provided by his godparent, he can request a temporary fairy. Well, technically, yes. But I know you love us so much you'd never replace us with- I wish I had a temporary fairy! This became apparent in One Man Band, where Timmy plays an ordinary triangle so badly that he creates natural disasters. A climactic setting like this would usually be triggered by a bad wish, but instead it's a throwaway gag. Dimsdale is supposed to be dim and dull, just an average city that Timmy's wishes make exciting. Something like a town mascot goat isn't hard to buy in such a cartoony cartoon, but now the town is littered with non-magical monsters and active volcanoes, making the world more random but less relatable. Driving home from my boring job, in my boring car, past boring scenery, past a giant boring lizard eating a boring bus. Plot points are often here because they are funny, not because they fit the caster plot, leading most characters to be boiled down to their simplest traits, especially Cosmo, Dad, and Mr. Crocker. Even minor players like Tootie, who disappears from the animated series after the season, has her stalker tendencies brought to the forefront. This line got me, though. <laughs> Sanjay gets his last few speaking roles, and his main joke has shifted from having a shrill accent to really liking Timmy. I wish my elephant's friend had 40 friends, all named Timmy! I mean, really liking Timmy. Well, I bet Sanjay doesn't have a date. <laughs> Timmy needs my date, Kimmy! I have three goldfish. I'm probably reading way too far into this, but there's a ton of comments on the Fairly Odd Parents wiki arguing about Sanjay's sexuality because of these kinds of jokes. A number of these came from episodes written by Kevin Sullivan, an openly gay man who, in a 2013 interview, hoped he'd someday get a gay character into a Nickelodeon show. 
This was achieved when Sullivan moved to the Loud House and his second episode featured a same-sex couple. I kept thinking about this quote because prior to that, he worked on Butch Hartman shows for 10 years. I can't say if a gay character was ever formally pitched and if that was the intention with Sanjay. Besides, there's a multitude of external cultural reasons for why that idea would have been shut down. LGBTQ plus representation in children's animation had a long way to go when these jokes appeared in the late 2000s, and I'm glad it's in a better place all these years later. Too bad Sanjay couldn't join the ranks of characters in the company's spotlight during Pride Month, even though the creators had to fight to include them. And I'm having one of those dreams where Timmy saves me again! But where is your white horse? The focus on Poof is decreased during Season 7. He's mostly used as a plot device, which makes the themes of responsibility for Timmy less prominent. The creative team loved having this 10-year-old get brutally destroyed whenever they got the chance, and sometimes he deserved it. So much so that Nicktoons made a surprisingly somber highlight reel. They made similar promos for some of their action shows like Avatar, but this one's my personal favorite. I still think about it even a decade later. <laughs> Oh, and who could forget that this is where Vicky sunk to a new level of evil. Having an NFT is awesome! I didn't know that meme was canon. I actually think Vicky is the only character who receives some decent, albeit self-contained, development. She's tried to kill Timmy far too many times to be a realistic babysitter. So frenemy mind reminds us she's still a teenager, becoming Timmy's new best friend after he saves her life. We get a look into Vicky's social circle of evil babysitters and see that she's supported by girls that worship her craft but would abandon her in an instant. It added a new layer to her character and Timmy learns that the best thing to do when Vicky's in peril is to let her perish. Mini bagel pizza anyone? Timmy's mom also got a strong starring role in Food Fight, where it turns out that she's actually a great cook. Everything she makes happens to look disgusting. It was a breath of fresh air, all wrapped up in a heightened take on competitive cooking shows. Nothing made me laugh out loud, but this was my personal highlight of the season for putting a positive spin on a stereotypically feminine joke. Although it doesn't excuse the subplot in Micecapades that can be summed up as woman be shopping. Buy it, buy it, buy it. On that note, I'm not quite sure what to make of Wanda, since I can tell the creative team was trying to balance her out. Her violent side is more playful, like when she wrestles Timmy for fun or joyfully beats up Cosmo to drain some extra magic out of him. <laughs> Wanda remains an occasional killjoy, but is also shown to be an instigator, gaslighting Timmy to teach him a lesson. This is at its worst in Lights Out, where she and Cosmo pretend to be monsters to frighten Timmy because he thoughtlessly told Poof a scary story. But this one has lots of BDE. Big Dave Thomas energy. Timmy wishes for there to be absolutely no light for eight hours, and now has to survive the night with only his flashlight in hand. <laughs> The idea for a cartoon without animation came from Adair, and while this is the literal definition of tell don't show, a lot of planning and creativity went into keeping the visuals interesting, when most of it was just eyes moving in a black void. Maybe the Stockholm Syndrome was starting to set in, but I had a blast watching 11 minutes devoted to this dumb idea. Thanks to the nuclear reactor I built in the basement, all my F's now glow in the dark! Of course, so does mother. Go! Oh, get away, you stupid boss! To a lesser extent, Chicken Poof similarly revels in the stupidity of its concept. Poof catches a contagious disease that turns anyone he sneezes on into a chicken. Cosmo and Timmy chase the baby all over town and into an insurance office where, oh my odd, is that Dwight and Pam from The Office? I love The Office. I love watching it on the Peacock streaming service. Peacock, baby! Or as I like to call it, the cock. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm the cock of the walk. Boy, you look terrible. When you can actually see the animation, it's gone through some minor changes. Season 6 was a little more technically impressive and added a bit of shading, although sometimes they just slept on a gradient. Now, the color palette is slightly darker, the line art is thinner, and some of the drawings are looser. Dave Thomas took on the role of storyboard director, and the show definitely resembles his boards more closely up until season 9. I made the connection after seeing the comics he penciled for Nickelodeon magazine. The greater attention to detail might be attributed to the rapid switch to HD 
televisions many consumers were making around this time, although the end result looks a little off. The characters have slightly darker palettes, but the backgrounds don't. On the plus side, some of the best lighting yet can be found in the atmospheric night scenes of Flyboy and Timmy's office on the top floor of a pencil factory in Boss of Me. The windows are made of glass, but they're tinted pink to resemble an eraser from the outside. A great design choice. Wow. I would have preferred that the audience never learn exactly what Mr. Turner did for a living, because that's such a relatable joke for a kid. Honestly, we learn way too much about Timmy's parents in general because of the sheer number of episodes they appear in. Their characterization isn't notably worse, but they push so much of the supporting cast to the sidelines, especially Timmy's schoolmates. Lame. Boring. Boring. Lame. Despite the small handful of stories I enjoyed, it's hard to scratch the feeling that so much of the season feels recycled, or like a lazy attempt to push the comedy forward. Cosmo, Wanda, and Poof appear in plain sight so often, to the point where some episodes are based around them appearing in public. Sequences that obey the rule of threes can take up a huge chunk of time, and the fairies losing their wands is overused as a plot device, which is a lazier roadblock than bringing up a new or pre-established rule from the rules. Some jokes are also straight up reused. Off the top of my head, I can think of two examples, and by that I mean I'm going to edit them in a week after I say this. If my calculations are correct, we'll find the boys dangling in a web in Mr. Crocker's living room, since as everyone knows, Crocker runs a spider hatchery. Cosmo! That was brilliant! That Dimodome was really dark laser in disguise, and the contest was just a trick to capture Timmy. Duh! Wow, Cosmo, that's so not like you to figure that out. Cosmo, I love you, but you have got to be the dumbest man in the world! Oh, Timmy! There can't be anyone in the world less intelligent than you! Oh, Timmy! I feel like the Cosmo episodes are a good litmus test for the lengths the season will go to get a laugh because that struggle is what his character represents. Similar to season three, his episodes have him grapple with a massive responsibility, though there's an added focus on his family. In Cosmo Rules, we learn that he's distant cousins with Jorgen, a silly reveal that I kinda like. It gives them common ground, leading to an exciting climax where they're forced to work together. By the by, a Thanksgiving episode where their families meet would have been perfect. Look, there I am, on that broken, withered branch at the very bottom. Double O Schnozmo introduces Cosmo's con artist brother, Schnozmo, voiced by Dana Carvey. I dig this premise, as it flips the script on a lie revealed story, but it's bogged down by too many similar jokes with one character, like having them repeat the same mistakes or a catchphrase, and this sort of thing becomes the main source of Cosmo's humor. You're Cosmo and Wanda's godchild, Lorenzo. It's Timmy! That's what I said! Hello! Temporary Fairy and Operation Nickelberg fall into the same trap, even though I really enjoyed the back-to-back -back plot twist of the latter. It turns out that Timmy's dad was right. His neighbor, Mr. Dinkelberg, was actually a villain devoted to ruining his life. Or at least that's what he tells Mr. Turner. Oh, Mr. Dinkelberg, I can't believe you really are evil. Oh, I'm not really evil, Timmy. I just knew how much it meant to your father to think I was evil. So you did all this just to make my dad happy? That's right. For this twist to work, you have to buy that Dinkelberg became aware of his neighbor's vendetta against him, which takes away some of the fun behind his oblivious responses. But it works better if you view this as a send-off to Dinkelberg, and with this being the season 7 finale, it set the stage for what was to come. Minus the Nixon jokes. Season 6 had a few continuity errors, like Mr. Turner now owning the car that belonged to Vicky after the events of Engine Blocked. The ones I spotted were easy to overlook, especially because the show was still making an active effort to expand on its lore. However, season 7 throws some of that world building out the window for easy laughs. He's going to destroy the Earth! For the funny! The worst example is my least favorite outing from this batch, Crocker Shocker. For some reason, Mr. Crocker's belief in fairies is what single-handedly powers Fairy World. It's a clever bit of irony, but hard to accept when it's introduced in episode 106, only to never be brought up again. Crocker himself has undergone a minor status quo change, where he's become fully aware of Timmy having fairy gods. Parents. He can be a brilliant inventor or a complete buffoon depending on what the episode demands, and half of his jokes now stem from how he lives with his mother. 
Just like mom and dad, Mr. Crocker pops up so often that he almost becomes a main character. He's the only villain to appear more than twice this season too. Even an episode about the Turners on vacation shoehorned him into a subplot where he barely adds anything to the story. It's like they took a small number of supporting characters and tried to make them an ensemble. You can see a slightly more sympathetic side of this terrible teacher in Bad Hair Day, where his accidental adoption of Poof leads to a bittersweet ending. Since Crocker knows of Timmy's fairies, he can form relationships with them, and his bond with Poof when in search of a hair overpowers his urge to catch fairies. It's about the only time this version of Crocker worked for me, as otherwise, he isn't taken seriously anymore. Oh, I can't raise a fairy baby, and I can't capture my own kin and mount him on the wall like some trophy! Even though Mother did far worse to me! No, Denzel Jr. needs to be with other fairies now. It's what's best for him. Yeah. Gotta love that Family Guy style zoom. Even though there were a couple of fun new takes on the cast, a lot of this season feels like a version of the Fairly Odd Parents spearheaded by someone who wasn't familiar with everything it had to offer. It's like a whole run of episodes based off of someone watching an afternoon of reruns. I'd wager that this new vibe might have been the result of the series acquiring a new story editor who hadn't previously written any episodes, Ray DeLaurentiis. His face was used as one of the Vicky head gags that changed in almost every intro along with 15 other staff members. Who are you people? Some of Ray's previous titles include writer and co-creator of The Bubsy Pilot, developer of Shaggy and Scooby-Doo Get a Clue, story editor on Coconut Fred's Fruit Salad Island, and Rainbow Butterfly Unicorn Kitty, and one of the screenwriters of Ice Age. The Adventures of Buck Wild. Nothing I'm too crazy about, but I suppose he was a good fit, considering that he also introduced a talking dog named Sparky into his Scooby-Doo show, and Timmy once had the same catchphrase that De Laurent has created for Bubsy. What could possibly go wrong? Hey, what could possibly go wrong? We're in Hackensack, New Jersey. Now we'll never get decent Chinese food. Okay, people who live near Hackensack, I genuinely want to hear your thoughts on this. In 2011, Nickelodeon celebrated the 10th anniversary of The Fairly Odd Parents with six new half-hour episodes. I suspect that these six extra episodes were produced as a part of the 20 episode season 7, but aired as season 8. That's likely the reason why this run was so short, and why it stylistically feels like season 7 part 2. Due to the length, it's time for every episode of season 8 of The Fairly Odd Parents ranked. From worst to best, by me, Nick, Tendo. <laughs> Done. Two episodes stretch out their set pieces and could have been cut down to 11 minutes. Love Triangle has Poof and Foop compete over the lead role in a school play for a chance to kiss their crush, Goldie Golden Glow. It's like a designer looked at a poster of geometric shapes and was like, there they are. Those are the character designs. This may have been a remnant of a failed pitch for a spinoff involving Poof and Foop attending spellementary school. I'm not a big fan of the episodes that this backdoor pilot was reworked into. Poof and Foop aren't entertaining enough to be protagonists, the gags don't escalate in a gripping way, there's no notable side characters besides the one-note joyful teacher, and nothing about the school makes the setting distinctive. Although, there is a plot device dedicated to resetting the school to the status quo at the end of each day. <laughs> What a fun first day of school! See you all tomorrow! I'm glad they got rid of those pesky stakes. They always get me nervous and emotionally invested. I wonder why this never went to series. There's my big boy! Invasion of the Dads is a sequel to Season 7's Add a Dad, where Timmy sent all the dad clones he wished up to live on their own planet. Now they're back because just like Mars, they want mummy. This is one of the first direct sequels since the revival, and I say it suffers from being a part of this super silly era. <laughs> Tensions are running high, but I can't take them seriously when everything is resolved by Timmy's dad using his wrench to inexplicably create floods. The dad clones are smart enough to know that Timmy has fairies, but the fairies aren't taken away because the dads are magical creatures and not Timmy's actual father. Even when the jokes are funny, stuff like this keeps taking me out of the moment, where it's technically right but it feels wrong. You have a perfect civilization. Why would you want to add a woman to it? This does not feel wrong.
This is what my videos sound like when I accidentally leave an audio track muted. Timmy's Secret Wish is the final double length special, in which Timmy is put on trial for being the worst fairy god kid ever. This is by far the most frustrating episode yet, although I enjoy how expressive the character poses are. There was an attempt to mimic the presentation and conflict of the classic specials, but details like the opening lack flair. <laughs> The attempt at fan service just feels off too. The Hocus Pocanos, a wasteland for unwished wishes, is filled with callbacks to things like the Giggle Pies that Timmy never unwished, and it could have just been Unwish Island. The Million Wishes song, which unfortunately isn't very catchy, references many past adventures, although the visuals are mostly unspecific. By the time I got to this one, I was beginning to accept the post-season 7 mentality of anything goes is what the Fairly Odd Parents was now, whether I liked it or not. Yay, Timmy! But then, after 21 minutes of lukewarm courtroom shenanigans, Timmy's secret wish dropped a monumental lore reveal. I secretly wish that everyone would stop aging so that I could stay 10 years old and keep my fairies forever! When did you make this wish? 50 years ago? This is followed up by a runner about Mr. Crocker naming random New Jersey cities. I got it! We were in Hoboken! I know this was an attempt to explain why the characters never age, even if the timeline continues to float in-universe, but it insinuates that Timmy selfishly sabotaged the flow of time just to keep his fairies, and was a grown man masquerading as a child for some unspecified portion of the series. Unlike Crocker's backstory, it doesn't matter if this was always the plan, because it isn't conveyed in a convincing manner. This could have been a cool idea if it didn't lead to played out gags about characters becoming extremely old or fat. Let's go meet some girls! There's one now! I saw her first! This is Chester's final line, by the way. It is not nearly as surprising that this was the Crimson Shin's final appearance. But who needs Leno when Letterman is canon? While the developments introduced in Cracker Shocker could be overlooked, Timmy's secret wish negatively affects prior episodes on a massive scale. Instead of celebrating the continuity of the series, it retcons the most compelling part of Timmy's story. He may not have grown up at all since season one and was never in danger of losing his fairies. Worst of all, he's back. Still not saying his name. If Timmy's secret wish did anything well, it's set up that Timmy considers his fairies a part of his family, which is the focal point of season 8's best entry, Meet the Odd Parents. The show actually calls Timmy out for being too reckless with his wishes by having his parents unknowingly discover his secret. My mom and dad know I have fairy godparents. You, we thought you were a time-traveling Italian witch who's blackmailing Santa. Mr. and Mrs. Turner are surprisingly understanding and embrace Cosmo, Wanda, and Poof into their family. It's by far the most uplifting episode of the whole series, as it's a literal wish fulfillment for Timmy to spend time with all of his parents at once. This one definitely earns its bittersweet ending. Maybe it's the noxious tar fumes, but I'm starting to feel like those fish are part of the family too. Once again, the comedy isn't great, but it builds off of established canon and ties jokes back into each other in a satisfying way. I've got magical bears! I can kind of say the same about When Losers Attack, where Mr. Crocker, Foop, Dark Laser, and Vicky form the League of Super Evil Revenge Seekers to destroy Timmy once and for all. They spend a lot of time establishing status quos between Timmy and his foes, like it's a half-hour Powerpuff Girls episode, but the interactions definitely deliver on the premise. You're the scariest baby I've ever met. Although, I'm still not sure how 24 hours before the evening equals lunchtime, or why exactly Vicky wants Timmy dead. I mean, she makes 11.50 11 an hour for babysitting the twerp, which was 3.50 above California's minimum wage in 2011. I can assure you that making this video has been nothing short of incredibly interesting. This would have been a good place to reintroduce Norm or the Pixies or any other anti-fairy rep besides Foop, cause I'm already sick of him. He had three appearances before season 8 and three appearances in season 8, already getting more attention than his nemesis. The downside of having villains from different pockets of the show casually know each other is that it makes the world feel a lot smaller, and that's the underlying vibe I got from these six half hours. Hey, Timmy! It's Trixie Tang calling to say I love you! This is the last time Trixie Tang was ever plot relevant. 
One thing found in almost all of Season 8 is this anticipation pose. It's everywhere. It's like the Butch Hartman equivalent of the Family Guy death pose. One thing found in almost all of Season 8 is a sense of finality. All of these are either direct follow-ups, answer a what-if question, try to cram in a variety of characters from the show's history, or feel like they could have been the end. And for a brief few months, it was. I guess some happy Sundays can't last forever after all. On March 14, 2012, The Fairly Odd Parents was renewed for a ninth season, returning a year later after a 15-month hiatus. I could only dream of having a 15-month hiatus from The Fairly Odd Parents. Editor's note, why didn't I say wish for a 15-month hiatus? It was right there! Assistant editor's note, uh, hi, I don't think I've, uh, I don't think I've ever spoken in a Nintendo video before. If I had to rank all of the seasons so far, my order at this point in the series would be Season 3, Season 2, Season 4, Season 5, Season 6, Season 1, Season 8, and finally, Season 7. I was the most excited to revisit Season 6, and was delighted to see it was a bit of an uptick in quality, but the lack of standout episodes and poor use of poof makes me prefer its predecessor. Season 8 is ahead of Season 7 because it's shorter and has Meet the Odd Parents. <laughs> <laughs> but the equally long season one has father time and no outright bad episodes, so it's better. Although, I prefer season six over both for having more variety in a more fleshed out world. Give that batch a shot if you have a hankering for more classic fop. I'm buff! I still hold that Wishology wouldn't have been a great conclusion, but it's definitely the end of an era. There's something of a continuity reset in season seven. Only a selective subset of characters carry over, any lore introduced is contained to one episode, and new storylines begin, but old storylines abruptly end or stagnate. Like, compare Season 5's The Masked Magician to Season 7's Super Zero. Both stories on a similar scale about a fake magical superhero becoming the savior of Dimsdale. The former involved loads of Timmy's friends, neighbors, teachers, heroes, and in-universe celebrities. It strikes me as an attempt to mimic the massive cast of The Simpsons. I don't have any enemies, except maybe my sister Tootie, or my ex-boyfriend Ricky, or my parents, or Chip Skylark. Then there's that Mark kid from Europe, and... Now imagine a Simpsons episode that only involves the family and news reporter Kent Brockman, and you got Super Zero. <laughs> I almost want to categorize the era after Ray De Laurentiis became story editor as a soft reboot that plays by its own rules, like when a new comic book writer takes over and only carries over some aspects of the previous run. I expect changes and I'm all for writers adding their own take, but I think the 7th or 8th season of a TV show shouldn't feel this different. You could argue that the crew wanted to keep it fresh, but why drastically change what had been working for 100 episodes? Or even 80 episodes? Sure, a lot of these stories work on their own, and most of their continuity or characterization issues are small, but I noticed them as a kid and they kept piling on during my rewatch. It was no longer rewarding to be a hardcore viewer who had seen every episode. And speaking as a kid who struggled to watch the full run around this time, I understand that decision. It won't stop me from nitpicking though. What are you, some kind of critic? Kids get a point. Post revival, the series became more gimmick driven, making some of the sweeping changes that Timmy TV was making fun of. Every new character or multi part episode was marketed as an event by Nickelodeon to drum up ratings. They even did this with regular 11 minute episodes. Like, remember Crocker Shocker? Can Timmy Turner save Fairy World? Find out in The Last Wish. The brand new Fairly Odd Venture premieres today at 4. Still, there were a handful of funny or charming episodes, and the different style might be up your alley. Season 8 is the last solid attempt at an ending, and while it ain't perfect, this is where I would've liked the series to end. Especially since there's far too much good stuff that comes after Channel Chasers to stop there. Plus, Meet the Odd Parents concludes with a pretty perfect character moment for Timmy. It harkens back to Remy's jealous rant from Fairy Fairy Quite Contrary about how Timmy has two families that love him, but now Timmy doesn't take that for granted. I realized I'm the luckiest kid ever because I have two really cool families. It's a sign that having fairies has made Timmy a better person and 
he's growing up. I kind of prefer not knowing exactly who Timmy will become as an adult, because you know that he's going to turn out all right, and that's all that matters. Maybe the noxious tar fumes have gone to my head, but it feels like Timmy's growing up. But after a full decade and 126 episodes, how do you continue the Fairly Odd Parents? What do you add to appeal to kids that weren't born when episode one premiered? How do you reboot it for the streaming age? What did you think of season six through eight? What did I forget to cover? Why am I considering making part three next year so I don't get burnt out? All I know is that there's one thing I'm excited about. I am done covering episodes produced in four by three. No more having to adjust the size of footage that comes from slightly different sources. No more blowing up this crummy footage because even though Nick still reruns the show, it never got officially upscaled like Spongebob or Avatar. And best of all, no more standard definition Doug Dimmodome. I want Dimmodome, Doug Dimmodome from you. I want Dimmodome, Doug Dimmodome from you. I want Dimmodome, Doug Dimmodome from you. I want Dimmodome. Okay, I ran out of footage.